Oh, wait. I don't have to press anything down here, right, Nate? Uh, no, just record okay. on the thing. Hey. Welcome back to another episode of the Black Menace Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Weaver, and I'm here with my other host. Nate Bird. Happy to be on the show, as always. Yes. And we have guests in studio today as well. Go ahead and say hey. Hey, my name's Marissa, and I'm happy to be here with you yes. guys today. We're so excited for this interview. Um, the guests just keep getting better and better. Um, yes, not indeed. that the ones last week weren't, the one before, but they just keep getting great. And I'm Period. super excited to <laughs> interview you and for you to share your story today. Um, but I go ahead and need to do something. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, Marissa has an amazing story. And y'all, some of y'all probably recognize her already. We'll talk more about her amazing accomplishments. Right. Um, but uh, Rachel's got the minutes moment. Yes, we'll, we'll gas you up today. I love to gas people <laughs> oh, up. Yeah. So <laughs> one, that's one thing you can make sure our, our people, we are very good at gassing people up, which I love. I know. I love black yes. people. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, um, I have the minutes moment today. So the minutes moment, I don't even know what I even came in my brain to think of this, but I didn't know this information. And so I'm so glad that I did it. But the minutes moment that I'm doing is Mari Copany. She um, basically was this young woman who lived in Flint, Michigan and ended up becoming a big advocate to help them to get more funding for um, um, fixing the issues with their water. Um, but her full name is Amariana Copany, and she was born on July 7th in 2007. She's now 16. Um, but when all of the issues in Flint began, she was really young. Um, so how she got her really the first like famous situation she was placed in is she wrote a letter to President Obama um, to bring attention towards the, the water crisis in Flint. Um, and that um, prompted a response from the president, which is kind of powerful. You know, this kid, yeah, um, yeah it was 26. It, well, it was Ooh. 2016. She's 16 now. Yeah. So she was crazy. what, like um, uh, nine? Yeah, she was like nine. Yeah, let me do my math. Yeah, she was nine. So she was. She just wanted to write the oh president as a little girl, and oh, President Obama responded because he's awesome. I love the no, Obamas really. forever and always. <laughs> That's my president. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, and so he responded. And he said, letters from kids like you are what make me so optimistic about the future. And then on May 4th, 2016, Obama visited Flint um, closer up to see the devastation um, of the people um, and what was happening with the water supply. And this um, contributed to nationwide awareness of the issues. And Obama eventually authorized $100 million to fix the crisis. Um, however, they still have faced issues because they need to fix plumbing. It's like a systemic issue. It's not just mm -hmm. something that um, one $100 million will fix because there's so many issues that are still impacting the community today. Um, however, she continued to do things to um, address the issues. And on April 13th of 2017, she addressed a large crowd at the Stand Up to Trump rally in front of the White House in Washington, D.C. Again, this is two thousand. She's like 10 years old. Right. I'm like, wow, I love <laughs> this for her. Yeah. And um, she uh, then and she talked about how Donald Trump um, was a candidate and how he had promised when he was a candidate, he promised to the people of Flint, including her personally, like he had met her personally and talked to her that he would fix the crisis. And he Trump obviously did? Trump he met did. her personally. Yeah. On his like Trump. campaign trail when he was, you know, trying to, you know, as, oh. Right, exactly. <laughs> and he told her that he would fix it. So, so she went and said, well, where is it? We need to to fix it. Um, and she said that President Trump had not fulfilled his campaign promise to her. Um, and then she also spoke against his um, immigration policies and other things. And I just think that that's really cool that she kept doing things. And um, she wanted to continue to bring um, light to the issues that were still facing her community. So in 2018, her and Pack Your Back teamed up to get teamed up um, for something called the Middle, Middle List, Mid, Little Miss Flint and PYB Water Drive, um, which was a GoFundMe um, effort to raise money for bottled water um, so that the state could fund a free bottled water program for the residents of Flint. And they got close to $50,000 raised during a month-long campaign, which eventually led to over 200,000 water bottles. And then in 2019, she started a new donation campaign uh, called Little Miss Flint Clean Water Fund, partnering with um, another company. And um, this basically is a, is a water filtration company. And a, the fundraiser allowed her to maximize um, donations um, and really just 
eliminating plastic waste overall because of how um, negative water bottles can be, you know, to the environment. Mm -hmm. So she's hitting a lot of issues. So her goal was one hundred thousand dollars. And into two thousand and um, 19 in September, she reached that goal. And then in June of 2020, she had another goal of $250,000, which she met. And then on Earth Day in 2021, she met a goal of half a million. And her fundraiser continues oh to grow God. with her goal of now a million dollars, just to mm. continue to not just help her area, but other parts of the country continue to have filtered water and, and access to clean water. Um, overall making more infrastructure for communities to have access to those types of things. And one of her quotes that I really like, she would say, my generation will fix this mess of a government. Watch us. Period. And she's 16 okay. now. And I believe okay. It. So she's 16 now. She's 16 now. So it's like 2023. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. So you could really do anything. Yes. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> like this little girl who just had a vision and obviously, I mean, I'm assuming she had parents and great support around her who encouraged her. But um, I just find stories like her inspiring because you can make an impact at any age. And, um, you know, she's not even in college. She's not even done with high school. And oh she's already done so much. And I know this is just going to jumpstart her to probably continue to advocate for all types of things and environmental issues, especially environmental racism. That's an issue that's not talked about a lot, mm -hmm. I feel like, on a really national true. scale. Yeah. Um, and it's it's actually really bad in some of the issues that affect impoverished communities, especially black and brown communities. Um, mm -hmm. The environmental issues are um, very hazardous, which contribute to, you know, other health issues. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's yeah, interesting. And even like, I don't know, just this random thought kind of popped into my head. But you're talking about all the things that she accomplished, even like as a 10 year old. I was like, in my head, I was like, dang, at 10 years old, I was frying ants on the sidewalk with a magnifying right. glass <laughs> and then eating them. Like yeah. that was my 10 year old life. And she's so, talking to Trump. Like yeah. she's going to a Trump uh, a right. Trump rally and saying I, yeah. like against him like you didn't do what you said you were gonna do <laughs> where is it like that's kind of crazy so yeah if anybody can fix the government it's Gen Z yes for sure. oh I we're fixing a lot of things even like in my corporation right now where I work working in corporate it's it's there's just little things that where I can see are us really fixing one of the you know some people have issues with Gen Z not wanting to work past five p.m. and things like that and older people, you know, kind of struggling with that. Like, what do you mean? You're not, you don't want to work past this. And um, I think that if any generation can help us to get to a more healthy work-life balance, just everything, mm -hmm. I think that we really can do it, even though we're labeled as the lazy generation, but <laughs> it's okay. You know, I think it's, I find it really interesting because I feel like people and even myself sometimes underestimate the power of our generation and the power of social media because doing something like what she did, I feel like more empowered to do something like that because I could literally make a post on my Snapchat and say, I need 10 people to help me do this or this or this volunteer project or donate $2. And all of a sudden, 10 people have done it and then they've shared it to 10 more. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, people want to help create packages or do mm -hmm. things for their community. And so it really is just putting the idea out there and having a purpose. And it's super cool to see someone like that at that age be able to do it because it like shows us like, okay, we're like 20, 21, 22, 23 or whatever. Yeah. And we still we have all these ideas and we all talk about them, but we haven't put that forward. And it really is just a step like forward and look how much it grew for her. So, yep. A hundred percent. Yeah. So shout out to her. Um, <laughs> I'm excited to see her journey. I'm like, Ooh, where are you going to go to college? Um, I have a love for people getting into like really cool colleges. So I will be on the lookout for her and her future. But next onto our interview portion. Now we got to, um, got to ask you some important questions to hear more about your story. And I know you're super oh, yeah. excited. So um, I just want to start off with kind of sharing more, like a little bit more about you, like where you're from. Um, you can talk about some of your accomplishments, uh, whatever you feel is necessary. Cause we'll, we'll get into the meat and potatoes yeah. as, we, as we keep talking today. Okay, I guess I'll just start with kind of where I came from, where I was born, and how I even got here to yeah, Utah let's and do it. share everything like that. So I was actually born in Odessa, Texas in 1998, November, um, and I was born out there, and I was actually adopted by my parents right now, and they're actually both a different race than me. So they're both um, white, Caucasian, and I'm African-American. So my mom is full white and then my dad is full African. 
And I took my 23 me whatever that thing mm, I not found a, out not the mostly, DNA test. <laughs> no, literally, I, <laughs> my mom also though my mom took it because she was yeah. adopted as well no so. no one could answer me yeah. on my dad's side of the family and that's mm. like the african side i wanted mm. to know like my african name anything mm. like that but i found out um i'm mostly from ghana okay. like that's where like the biggest african part is um so i was born there i was actually adopted through lds family services oh wow um and it's kind of sketchy because I've been seeing now, like the years I was adopted, that dude who was like hosting those agencies actually arrested. Oh, wow. I just haven't dug deeper because it's interesting. Yeah. Sometimes like, family services has an interesting past. Yes. Mm -hmm. for sure. Especially like, like early 2000s, late 90s too. Mm -hmm. So I've heard I haven't dug much well. into it. Yeah. Because my parents changed my name. So like oh. on my birth certificate or changed their name. So they're the original parents. So I don't oh. have my original parents' names on my birth certificate. Okay. Yeah. So it's just like there's a little bit of sketchiness between that. I just haven't dug deeper into it yet because I'm like, eh. Whatever. You need to be emotionally <laughs> ready to be like, what is this? Yeah. Let me accept it. it be ready to, to get to that point. I know. I was like, I'll figure this out in like a few years. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I was adopted by them. Um, they flew straight to Texas, got me when I was two days old. And they oh, were wow. currently living in Mesa, Arizona. Um, so that's where they flew me back to and raised me until they got my sister and she was also adopted. She was adopted from Las Vegas, Nevada, and she is half, um, Caucasian and half Hispanic Filipino. Okay. So that is her ethnicity. And then, yeah, we lived in Mesa, Arizona, most of our lives. Um, me and my sister went to like a plethora of different schools. So we went to charter school private school, performing arts school, and public school. So wow. I, yeah. Whenever we were upset, we just moved. <laughs> um, my parents put us into like a lot of extracurriculars. So like gymnastics, dance, singing, um, musical instruments. So I play three instruments, the piano, oh, wow. the cello, and the harp. Wow, I need to hire um, you for my wedding. She plays the yeah, cello like, and the know. harp. Okay, those are beautiful harp, instruments. Yeah. yeah, I need to get gonna, back into it because yeah. I need to apparently buy my own now. <laughs> and so, harps are really um, expensive. Yeah. yeah, we got our first baby harp, and my mom's like, "Okay, you're too tall now, and if you want like a grand harp, you have to be like really in it." And I was like, "I want to play volleyball." <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, they cost yeah, like so, as much as a car. No, I know. Harps, yeah, it is expensive, but. Um, yeah, so I'm grateful for my parents for all the opportunities they gave us along the way. And they also raised us in the LDS church. So being adopted, you're sealed into the church since you weren't born in the church. Um, you're mm -hmm. not considered of the faith yet. So me and her were actually sealed um, to our parents. And I don't remember myself being sealed, but I remember my sister being sealed. Mm -hmm. um, and that we were raised Mormon. I went to Mountain View High School in Arizona. Where I got into volleyball as in like seventh, eighth, ninth grade. Um, because in Arizona, ninth grade is freshman and it's high school, so mm. everyone's together. Um, I actually lived in Mesa for a year. Okay, yeah. So you that, kind yeah. of already know yeah. the vibes. I um, I right spent a lot of now. time yeah. in Tempe, in Phoenix as a child, okay. doing stuff I probably shouldn't have, <laughs> you know, doing whatever in Mesa. And um then uh, one of the things we would always do is come up to BYU volleyball camps. Those like extensive four day sports camps they have up here. Mm -hmm. um, so we would come up there frequently before we even moved to Utah. And um, when I was like 15, we came up here for our summer as we normally would. And um, my mom, who usually stays every day at BYU volleyball camp with us taking pictures or whatever, she just disappeared. And we were like, okay, whatever. And she came back and she told us she was kind of like scouting out the area. She got her bachelor's at BYU. Um, she used to work with a company out here and she was kind of talking to them or whatever. And I was like, okay, weird, whatever. Um, and so we left BYU volleyball camp and we went back to Mesa and we found out that both of my parents who worked for the same company got laid off for the job from mm. their jobs mm. at the same time. Oh, wow. And so the reason why my mom was kind of like lurking around in Utah is because she was seeing if she could get back into her job mm. that she kind of had when she was here, like if, before she had us or whatever. Um, and unfortunately for me, <laughs> they actually like desperately need, so she's a speech and language pathologist and they definitely need and overpay that position out here in Utah. Mm. And so literally it was in within weeks she was like i'm taking the position and she moved and we were wow. like okay we're just gonna stay with dad and then we were like wait we don't want to not be with our mom mm -hmm. and so we went out here and we tried going back and forth for like months and eventually we were just like okay we got to get started if we get started it's august like school starts 
So we got to get going. Mm. So we just decided to get started. Um, my dad stayed in Arizona to like fix up and sell the house. And then we got moved into Highland, Utah and started at Lone Peak. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I started at Lone Peak and um, played volleyball there. I was like one of the only people um, on the freshman volleyball team, I think, when I got there. Or was it sophomore volleyball team? Um, so I got there my sophomore year and suffered through my sophomore and junior year before I was like, I can't do this. I want to go to Sky Ridge. Um, they were opening that year. So this is 2018. So I transferred to Sky Ridge my senior year and played volleyball there, had a breeze. And then I went to Utah State and I played volleyball up there for one semester before oh, wow. I absolutely lost it up there. Oh, man. And um Ended up taking a little visit to the mental hospital before I realized I wanted to stay in Utah County by my parents hmm. and um, moved back, transferred to UVU. And I started a few semesters at UVU while also simultaneously being in the restaurant industry. I worked around managing seven different Chipotles around Utah nice. and then moved over to Top Golf, where I got into serving and events and training and then management and kitchen management. Um, and then I was tired of Utah, and so I decided to start doing UVU online and moved to Colorado because I wanted something new. Um, and out there, I decided to help my friends open up um, their new little restaurant lounge bar area so I could get some bar experience and stuff out there. Um, and then some events occurred out there that ended up drawing me back to living in Utah and being around my family and friends. And um, I accepted a new position as a restaurant supervisor over three different restaurants Let's go. in Springville, of course, Mormon County, oh, believe wow. it or not, not. Springville. Yeah, literally. That's um, deep down. Yeah, because I left the church at 19. So I'm like, oh my gosh, not back into it. But um, so I actually really like it down there. And um, I'm just about to finish college with my bachelor's degree. Let's go. I do college online to manage um, working a salaried nine to five position. And then I also model, as I say, one of my hobbies, but it's basically become like a job now. Oh, yeah. I mean, you've been busy <laughs> um, the last couple months. Yeah, I've been pretty busy. And yeah, I'm here now and just trying to like share my story, be an example. Um, I've struggled with mental illness, um, specifically bipolar disorder. So throughout all of this, this is kind of something I've dealt with as well. So I like to educate people about um, different processes of that disorder, different therapies mm. I've gone through, um, different events and how I handle them, especially in the modeling industry, mm. in the acting industry, just in that high pace industry in general. Um, and just generally being confident with yourself. Um, I don't know, stuff like that. Yeah. So that's what I'm here to do now. That's why I'm like really happy you guys invited me on the podcast and yeah, I'm happy to talk with you guys because you guys are other icons that I feel like oh, spread the same word and try to spread <laughs> the you. same information and everything like that. So, yeah. Thank well, you. We're thrilled to have you for sure. Thank you. So we want to like dive into everything. Thank you for like the synopsis. And now we want to kind of like yeah. get into it just a little bit. Right? <laughs> I know. That's so, like meat and potatoes. Yeah, grand yeah. story. <laughs> um, do you want to just kind of tell us a little bit about like what it was like uh, growing up? Um as a, like as part of like a transracial adoptive family mm -hmm. what kind of what was that like what did it do for your self image um how did you think of yourself all of that yeah okay so um i like to think about this because it's crazy i feel like i'm not starting to realize anything mm -hmm. until like honestly like 18 19 20 21 mm -hmm. i'm like looking back and i'm like hmm there's something wait that wasn't right yeah. or this was off but um because I feel like of my parents' uh, race, we definitely were in a more white neighborhood, um, but like lower middle class, I guess, or like, yeah, lower middle class, mm. um, I would say. And so I never really realized, um, and where we are in Arizona, there's a lot of Hispanic culture. Yeah, there and there's like a lot of black people, like low key. I mean, so in our ward, I guess there is a lot of like white people, Caucasian people, but at school, I didn't really feel left out a ton, mm. but I did, um, I did somehow struggle like with bullying somehow. And it was always about the hair or the skin and just like put, the putting sand in the hair mm. and this, uh, the sun makes me super, super dark out there. And then, um, 
trying to have people understand because my mom also worked at the same school we went to elementary school mm. trying to have people understand like this is my mom mm. and then also having a mother who didn't adopt me till she was 41 so she's like 67 now mm. so having like an older parent too and mm. all my friends parents are like 22 <laughs> i yeah. don't know how old they were no yeah like you know what i'm saying so yeah. having them say this stuff about like oh is that your grandma or like that's not your mom and then um the thing with like the whole hair thing is like, if I didn't do certain things my parents wanted, my punishment would be my mom not doing my hair before I went to school. Wow. And oh, wow. I didn't realize that's, like, wow, that's a lot for like a, yeah. black, a black child. That's that like, is, and yeah. I have like that's an afro, a, like it's braided wow. down right now. I have a hair curly no, afro, yeah. you know. I mean, mine is pressed down too. So I understand <laughs> like, yeah, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Thinking about like, and I didn't even realize it back then. I just remember like keeping my hoodie on mm. every time and my teacher being like, okay, girl, it's 115 degrees outside. You have to take your like coat off and like calling my mom to see what was wrong. And my mom coming back and doing my hair and saying like, you know, kind of this is what happens when you don't listen. But I don't think she realized right. yeah, what no. she was doing 100%. by that. That's she intense. just knew that was like the thing I always demanded in the morning. And so she was like, fine, I'm not going to do it. But I don't think she realized like the hair was the worst weapon to use, I guess. Because yeah. that's more than just, that's not really a punishment. That's like a, I don't even know. I mean, that, that's, <laughs> that's attached. Like hair is sacred for black people. So that's like, yeah, it, it, like, it, it, and there's so much trauma with hair as well. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. um, with our community and just like what you were saying with treatment and whatnot. And my mom always taught me um, no matter what's going on, you need to look like you have your life together. I don't care. Yeah, like not messy. Yeah, you can't because we're just perceived as, you know, more. Disheveled. Yeah, just like things like people can see our hair that we took a lot of time on or very it is a well-kept style mm. um white people's perception of that hairstyle will think that it is unruly think that it's not like my curly hair people when it's out it's not, oh it's just so like uh, people have said just comments like that and i'm like no i actually spent a lot of time on this style <laughs> it looks crazy to you but this took a lot of time so um yeah mm -hmm. yeah no so um things like that i always like from the beginning of time wore my hair in either two little afro puffs or like one bun because I never wanted to wear it down because I feel like I looked like Corbin Blue. <laughs> and so um, just because I've heard it's a very conservative with the way we dress, it was very like private school dress everywhere. Mm. So like khaki shorts, like right at the knee, like prep school skirts below the knee, like collared polos, like not very much personality and everything. And so um, I don't know. I feel like I kind of, they implanted the tomboy in me. Like, it was on them. Mm. They're the reason I'm bi. <laughs> That's what I told them. Like, this is I'm on so you. Like, y'all did it. <laughs> yeah, literally. So um, I didn't really get to embrace, like, really much femininity. Um, it, like, I don't know if you guys know, like, about the Mormon church. Kind of, like, how you, you're supposed to be very feminine. You're supposed to let, not, like overstep like the man you're supposed to let the man take care of the household and from like a very young age like even playing with dolls or barbies and stuff i was like i don't want to get married like i don't want a wedding and like growing up i was like i don't want a baby from a man like is there a way to make one without a man being <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm so I was crying. like, is there like yeah. something I could do? And then like growing into my career, I was like, okay, I seriously don't know if I want to get married or have kids for a minute now. Like I want to have my career. I want to get everything laid out and everything. So there wasn't like growing up in the church, I was like, okay, what do I do if I like don't want to just stay at home or I don't want to, mm -hmm. like I want to be in a like I don't know, man surrounded career or something mm. like that. And so just trying to navigate that being like 12 <laughs> and like dealing with the different things at school and then the things at home and being Mormon, it was just like a lot. And I guess as a child, I was always that like attention seeking, very loud, throwing tantrums, very angry, like always kind of like that ADHD child. And so on top of all that, trying to grow into everything else was pretty chaotic, but it didn't necessarily feel like that in the moment, but like looking back, I was like, oh, this is what happened or this is how, why I feel this way now or things like that. Or talking to my parents about it, they're like, oh, we shouldn't have done that. Or, oh, we didn't do that or something that mm. I like very distinctly remember. So um, yeah, it was very interesting uh, growing up. But as far as like living life and making friends and 
kind of having my own groups. It was so much fun. And I loved being in the sun. I loved always wearing a bikini, mm. always wearing no clothes and shorts and just swimming, being in the sun and just generally enjoying all the activities like my parents put me into and mm. me and my sister into. So despite the church stuff, I'll always be grateful for all the opportunities they gave us, I guess, mm. because I feel like being adopted, like it could go quite a few ways, but I felt like they definitely took on the, our kids are going to be stars one day. Yeah. And so you could try and do everything. Yeah. So, um, but in that, it also meant like, if we did it, we had to put our all into it and have mm. to be like, damn near perfect. Oh. And so I don't know. I always teeter back and forth with like, I'm grateful because I'm here now and I can do so many things, but it like now I struggle with like perfectionism mm. and thinking about that. And so just like thinking about um, everything now, it's still to this day, a kind of like love hate relationship with everyone and everything I did because I know how to do a lot of things and I'm grateful for where I am. But at the same time, it's always been a lot of pressure my whole life. Yeah. It's been a lot of stress, mm. but it's been fun and I'm yeah. here now. It's right. so like, what, what is going on? I, I feel like that's growing up though, is realizing, looking yeah. back at life and being like, okay, I have immense gratitude for whatever situation I was in or whatever sacrifice your parents made and then being like, dang. But now I'm seeing like my parents were not perfect people. Yeah. And now I'm seeing like, oh wait, I'm seeing the way that now I'm kind of messed up and like feeling the impacts of yeah. your choices. You know what I mean? And it's this, it's a battle. But just because I feel like I'm going through the same thing, seeing like, oh, wait, the way that I viewed, you know, my relationship with my parent is just way different now that I'm older. Like, I'll never be able to unsee it, uh, and, no, and it's not a bad thing, but it's just part of growing up. I don't know if you resonate with that at all. Nate. Oh, yeah. No, I agree. I think that, yeah, learning to kind of separate the good and the bad or just kind of nuance your, your upbringing, I think that's a part of, like, maturing and growing up. I just recently, I won't get too much into it, but I just recently had a conversation with my father where... Um, <clears throat> Basically, what I told him was that, you know, when I was a kid, you made it abundantly clear to me that you were my father and not my friend. Mm. And now I'm telling you, we're not friends, but mm. I am grateful to you for being my father, you know? And obviously, mm. he wasn't very happy to hear that for a, pl a, a plethora of reasons. Now they want to be friends but, now, and you're like... Right. It's like, <laughs> right. No, like, we have not been friends for many, many years, and now all of a yeah. sudden you're trying to be my friend. It's, mm. it's not going to work like that, you know? Not without a lot of, like, work. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think that's just a part of maturing, is, like, realizing that there were, there's good and there's bad. So. Yeah. Okay, so I want to kind of get into the differences that you experienced, you know, you had this experience and I mean, you had your experiences that made you feel like, okay, yes, I'm adopted. I'm a transracial adoption family, right? But now you're in Utah mm -hmm. in a very different environment where there are less brown people um, <laughs> when you're going to school out and about interacting and working and, and whatnot. And, and you're obviously older and at a more, you know, I'd say vulnerable time, um, just like later teenage years is just a, yeah. But um, yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious, like, what was the biggest difference you'd say between, um, if you want to start talking about how Utah was and like what the biggest differences were between um, growing up here in your teenage years and then and being in Arizona? Um. Okay. Yeah, I feel like I can just like describe it in a story about just hey, let's do it. Yeah, being dropped into Highland, Utah and going to Lone Peak. Um I feel so I moved here when I was 15 and a half. So right before I turned 16. Um what year would that have been? This would have been 2015. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um I knew nothing about like Utah or anything. I just always went to the BYU volleyball camps, like I said. Mm. So I knew about that. And I just knew everyone was like kind of weird, mm. whatever. I was always like in it for the skill. Like I love, I mm. play volleyball, you know. So um, I just didn't realize like outside of BYU, it stretched. You're <laughs> like, like the people oh, in the culture. It's like, not just stretched. here. It's like, oh, wait, this is all of Utah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And like Utah County, like I wasn't really aware of it. I just remember like Utah always being like, we stay very close to BYU and around that. So I just didn't know. Um, so going to Lone Peak, um, it was really hard. I think one of the first things I realized is when I made the volleyball team, I had to get like letters from like my bishop and from other people claiming that I wasn't like scouted to be on that team oh, or wow. like to be a, like on whatever. So oh, wow. I didn't know their sports were like that. I didn't know it was locked down like that. Oh, in Utah, really? Yeah. I, wow. Lone Peak, oh, Pleasant Lone Grove, Peak like oh, the top, like, you know, the top championship schools. Oh. So um, they were like pressing me about that. And I was like, okay, this is crazy. So I already was feeling kind of like ostracized because mm. the only thing I had was like joining the volleyball team and then like being able to like 
play volleyball and then realizing like I threw the tournament because they couldn't verify my status of residence and I didn't even know what was going on. Mm. That's, that's when I was like, oh, it's this kind of school. Like I didn't really realize. Mm. Um, and so volleyball was like my first introduction to Lone Peak. And then after I moved um, into Lone Peak, eyes were definitely on me, I would say. Um, everyone called me Arizona because they couldn't remember my name, but they <laughs> moved from Arizona. <laughs> and I shortly figured out, I think that year, I was like one of like 15 black people. Well, out and of how many? Out, huh? One out of, of 15 out of black people. Like out of all the classes. Out of the whole well, school. So like, I mean, like how many people were in the school? There were I 15 can't black think. people. Lone Peak is a big school. Yeah, I'd like say at least 2,000. I'd yeah, say yeah, at least yeah. there's very... Wow. So 15 black people out of 2,000. Yeah, like there's so many. That's it's a big school. And like you have right to now. think like black or like African, not like Polynesian and stuff. Because we would kind of just honestly at the end of the day say like people of color. Mm -hmm. And it would just be like few Hispanics, few po Polynesian, Tongan, like you know what I'm saying? So And then African Americans. So it was like... Um, pretty crazy but um, moving there and realizing the culture shift and my life had just got like my life was perfect in Arizona or, like I couldn't even believe we had to leave I couldn't believe we we're going to Utah I believe my mom picked it because she wanted us to stay Mormon and she loved the church and I was just starting to be fed up with the church and with mm -hmm. like her attitude around the perfection and everything she was kind of like expecting of us so I was so annoyed when we moved up here and then like I don't know, like the anxiety and the ADHD and the depression just kind of started to settle in slowly. Mm. And then um, the pressure put on, like, put on from our coach and the practices. I mean, she had us up at like 5 a.m. doing weight training till 6 a.m. And then school, oh, we were wow. in AP classes, had to maintain like a GPA higher than the average just because they wanted to be able to say, we they do this and they're academic too mm. you know like double scholarships wow. and then on top of being new on top of being mormon in utah which is a different well, type and of being mormon black yeah. and also yeah. like we're not even addressing mm. racial things like yeah the undertones of any of that that could be influencing things yeah as well. and yeah. like i came from arizona where we wear sh like short shorts and like tank tops um at this point i still was only ever wearing my hair in a bun girl no edges mm. never even knew how to do edges yet yeah. so just a bun with like stuff everywhere um i didn't like because my how conservative my mom was, she wasn't big on like fake lashes, foundation. Mm. Like she didn't like us wearing that. She like thought we looked like stuff. whores. Like oh. yeah, she thought it was like a look for horrors, I guess. And so just like the I like I was not well. <laughs> like, yeah. I couldn't find my place. Everybody was perfect. Everyone was pretty. Everyone had like put together outfits, like everyone mm. dressed up for school. Whereas in like Arizona, we're like Damn near where I got pajamas and a right. swimsuit. Like and it's so hot. Like right. half the time we're in the courtyard. Yeah. I'm also not used to like the environment of like an all indoor school for the snow. I'm mm. not used to the weather. I'm not used to driving in the snow. And I'm not used to like the seasonal depression. Mm. And I'm not used to like everyone at the school I was going to wanting to end their lives. And so like mm. coming into that. Mm. And then being there the year I was there, two people committed suicide. Because, yeah, I, there I've was heard... like 13 attempts. And that was literally wow. of the years. Of course, it was the years I was there. Yeah, I heard I've heard that we can talk more about that as you mm -hmm. keep going. But I've heard yeah. that about Lone Peak yeah. in particular has extremely bad. I don't know what's going on in the soup there or what they're serving, because that's what I've heard about, like, they have like one of the highest suicide attempts and like rates. Yeah, literally in, in like the, the country. country. Yeah. No, well, the country. Utah itself is has the highest rates of teen suicide of any other state, I believe. Like they're number one or number two. They're like at the top. Yeah, of and the Lone list. Peak is the that school from yeah. what I yeah. That's wild. Yeah. It's like if you're not in early, then you'll never be able to be in. Or if you do get the chance, like with volleyball, you have to like work twice as hard. I feel like, or prove yourself mm. twice as much, mm. or everything. And so it was just so horrible. And dealing with all that led to, like, a lot of, like, thoughts of suicide and self-harm and struggles mm. with me and, like, trying to attempt suicide and being in the mental hospital. And so I decided to leave Lone Peak completely and transfer to Sky Ridge because I just, like, couldn't handle it anymore. Mm. And it was honestly so amazing. Like, there was way more Black people there. <laughs> like, yeah. I met my group of friends. I met my two best friends that I'm still friends with to this day. And it, it was like a whole new eye-opening experience. Um, and so compared to Arizona, like, it's just so much different. Nobody cares what you do. Mm. Nobody looks like that at school. Like, I don't know how to explain it, but nobody looks like that. Like, no, nobody it's true. Wears, like, I know jewelry, what you're talking about. Like, nails, Utah culture there. is very... And I say this because people joke about like black culture. You always have to look on point. 
which is true. I do agree with that. Not but Utah. I feel like Utah does it in a different way. I don't know how to describe it. I don't know what words to use, but I just think Utah does it's it in like... a... Because I feel like if you do it when you're you're black, like, it's still fine. Like, people are going to be like, mm. that's just you. You're not going to be looked at, like, terribly. Do you need to look on your best? You know, the jokes about Atlanta and always popping out and yeah. looking nice. That, I do think that that is true about yeah. our community. However, I think it's done very differently than like in Utah where it's like you're like side eye like scolded yeah. for not doing it um versus like I feel like black people just they won't bad night if you choose to not like subscribe and do that I don't know if you no, guys think or have any thoughts about that or whatever but yeah no that's exactly like every other city I go to like New York Miami whatever I feel like I can be myself mm. and like definitely bring they want me to bring out the black culture even more mm. like they were so mad when I showed up with my Utah white girl hair in Miami when I went to compete mm. they were like where's your afro and so you know i took on my hair and everything and i showed them and they were like this is high fashion this is the mm, blah 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 but in wow. utah this is not high fashion this mm -hmm. is messy this is disheveled this is distracting this mm. is something to make fun of or this talk is unattractive about. Like, like yeah, yeah. or like yeah or like or looks not, like a boy or yeah, something like or not that. seen as sexy even yeah, right exactly like, mm -hmm. and so it's so nice to like be able to travel because I feel like I can be a stranger and a new person and I feel comfortable wearing my hair out. And like here, I feel so nervous wearing my hair out. Like, mm. I'm just like, I don't even know. I can't do it. Like, it's so hard. And I don't understand what like barrier or wall I crossed through where it like, just can like the state just like constricts me. Like I just don't want to answer questions or answer to anybody about it. I mean, Whereas everywhere else, no one will say no one will say. I mean, anything. it makes sense based on your experiences. I feel like what you're describing it sounds pretty traumatic. Going yeah. from <laughs> something that you felt, I mean, moving at that age would be hard for anyone. Yeah, but all of the other aspects that were involved with your transition would just be like overwhelming. And again, the racial undertones, I can't even imagine what they would be like. Yeah. I've been to yeah. Highland, Utah, Alpine, Utah. Like it's very, very white, very, mm -hmm. very LDS. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine what that would feel like for you coming into people that already have cliques and groups and feeling like an out, like one of 15 out of 2k like that's that's kind yeah. of you know what I mean? like i can't imagine how that would feel so it, you probably just have like unrecognized like trauma that it, it sits with you that if that's why when you're here it feels like you just can't even do something different even if you want to yeah and a lot of people resonate with that black people who've lived in utah yeah no i agree i think um utah it hasn't I've, I've watched people kind of shift as they've left utah like when you're mm -hmm. in utah i feel like there's this version of yourself uh, for black people a lot of times but then once they leave utah that version changes and i mm -hmm. think that um it's the racial undertones it's the pressures uh to be and to act a certain way especially if you are um, deeply entrenched in lds culture i think that that also plays a role um one thing and i this is something i had seen other people do it but i never experienced it myself until last year um i had just graduated from byu i went on a cruise with my wife for a birthday and, uh, you know, in Utah, I just had this feeling like I'm tired of white people. I don't really want to be around very many white people. You know, the ones that I do keep around, I want them to be like very genuine people who are mm -hmm. honest with me. I can be honest with them. Right. And, um, you know, so it made me very worried with who I wanted to talk to, mm -hmm. who I wanted to associate with. I leave Utah. I go on this cruise. And on the cruise, we had, the, me and my wife, we had gone to like go get in the hot tub. We get there and it's just like full, like wall to wall with with people we've never met all white people right and like old white people <laughs> and i was like okay let's go so we just jump in the hot tub and we're sitting there i'm like cracking jokes with these people like we're like chopping you know chewing the fat mm -hmm. um you know talking with each other and at the end of it, it's like hey it was nice to meet you guys we all give each other hugs right and then i get out of the hot tub and i'm like no hold on i wouldn't have done that in utah nope and i was like what changed yeah. like it wasn't even a conscious thing but mm -hmm. i was like what changed from from here like being on this cruise feeling completely comfortable to be my authentic self around these people that I've never met before to where I go to Utah and I can't, like, I don't, I don't feel like you yeah. really are scared, yeah, like, like fearful. You, yeah. And I think a lot of it honestly is it has to do with the fact that people here don't present who they really are mm. like on the outside. I think people tend to be very fake. And so you never know who you're dealing with. Yeah. And like, sometimes you have to find that out the hard way. So it's better to just avoid it altogether. But yeah, yeah, it's wild. Yeah. I, don't know. I feel like, the thing where you say you're like seeing people leave Utah, every time I go on vacation, my Instagram feed like shifts for a second. <laughs> and I like, you literally see me doing like mm. photo shoots in Utah versus like photo shoots in other like states and stuff. The hair they give me is different. The outfits they give me. And it feels like they definitely are more embracing the culture and bringing out features of the culture where in Utah, mm. it might be more dampening. Mm. And then like, 
I don't even know. I just find it so funny because like you said, I feel like the one thing I always tell people when they're like, oh, I'm going on vacation or I'm leaving Utah. Um, I always think back to like every time I visit Santa Monica Pier, it is so crazy how many people will just walk up. What are you doing tonight? What are you doing tonight? What's your name? Where are you from? Like, whereas here, like there is nobody who does that. Mm. Like it was so easy to find, like it's so easy to find stuff to do everywhere mm. else. Yeah. Like on the weekend, you just have to walk on the streets in the city mm -hmm. and you can talk, like walk up to anybody and they'll be like, oh, we're going over here or this club over here or like this game is going on. But like out here, it like feels awkward. Like you said, to like walk up to people and be like, hey, where are y'all headed? They'll be like, why are you asking or like mm. why, why do you care like it doesn't it's not the same energy you know yeah. and then there definitely isn't people like necessarily coming up to me or whatever and if they do it's because they think i'm like an athlete or that i'm not from here <laughs> or don't belong so <laughs> are you lost or <laughs> when people say that Thurl to you bailey's daughter wait are you what Thurl bailey's daughter who is that he's like a basketball player oh i don't know who that is oh, they've asked you if you were her daughter or you were his daughter yeah they've always asked that they always ask if i have different wild. byu basketball players really basketball players or they ask like what i'm doing here i don't like living wow great, <laughs> not great a living that's a funny <laughs> response though <laughs> living <laughs> exactly oh, he said um this is my home this is where i'm living as a person yeah. like this is not anything else more than that um so i'm curious a little bit more if, if you're willing to talk more about mental health and what mm -hmm. that was like um, at Lone Peak, what that felt like in that environment and then like transitioning to when you went to college and and what that was like and what it, your journey has been like, just because I feel like mental health in, in our communities and I feel like our community, the black community is we're, we're getting better. We're doing better, but there's a lot of work. Every time I have a conversation with my mom or my grandma, I'm reminded of that. Um, <laughs> but I just would love for you to share as much as you feel comfortable sharing for yeah. our listeners, just because um, it's just such a nuanced experience with all the intersectionality know, that you right? have. Um, no, so I actually like I'm very authentic about this on my platform because I'm like, I might as well be authentic about it. So if something happens. Yeah. I like am able to just be like, listen, y'all, like this is a moment, whatever. Um, but yeah, since a very like young age, I definitely express myself through like anger and tantrums. And I was always very loud, very vocal. Um, and my sister was always like the very shy, quiet one. So if something was like upset me I always like let somebody know right away so it led to my parents I feel like giving me like a lot of overly extra attention um and then it kind of like left my sister maybe like in the shadows mm. because she like kind of kept it in and I've always been the one to kind of like let it out um and I didn't realize and all in Arizona like we never went to therapy we never went to anything with like our bishop we never went to counseling nothing like that and I didn't realize until like I've been doing research in the adoption and like foster care system that like therapy with adopted children is absolutely essential, especially if they're like a different race yeah. um, than you or like they have situations they're coming from that you can't exactly explain to them. And so um, it wasn't until we got to Utah that my parents entertained therapy and it was because um, they saw how horrible the move was on us. Um, I had like started engaging in like self-harm behaviors. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to release my anger. I was like punching holes in walls, like mm -hmm. doing white people. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. That's no, so but, you know, I, well, it's the half white in me, yeah. but I was like releasing my anger, breaking things, hurting myself. Um, and I always had this mentality, like I never wanted to try and hurt anybody else, but like I would hurt myself instead. Um, and just like crazy stuff like that, where I didn't know what was wrong, but I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know what else to do besides like kind of find something else to get my mind off the pain, I guess. And so that's when my mom's like, Hey, you need to go to therapy. So of course she goes through LDS therapy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it took like two points where I was like, Oh, hell no. Like, I yeah. do not want a Mormon therapist. Yeah. Um, and so she found a different place. Um, that I started going to therapy too. And it was great there. I just kind of was getting um, into everything with them. And then I went to Utah State and I didn't know kind of like what I was going to do out there um, because school therapy, school therapists are like not good at all. Um, and so I, like I said, I only lasted a semester up there because like the mental health was like not well. And that's when I came home and my parents actually like admitted me to a mental hospital at UVU, like the UVU psychiatric hospital or the Utah Valley, whatever. And I was there for like two weeks. And that's when I got medication 
got set up with psychiatrists, got set up with like actual therapists surrounding adoption mm. and like the separate issues mm. um, and started the journey. And that would have been around 2019, I'd say. 20, yeah, because it's been like four years of this, <laughs> but we're here now. And so, um, so we started there. And um, this is when I transferred back to UVU and I started going to an amazing therapist that I'm still with to this day. And that was adoption therapy centered. So we started speaking about kind of the trauma you endure being just separated from your mother at birth. Mm. And then the trauma you endure being raised in a religion and then raised by a different race of parents and Mm. then going through my childhood and working through kind of the things we kind of talked about and how they affected I don't know, just everything that I am now or that I do now. Um, And alongside of that, uh, we started doing medications, going through the process of all these different types of medications for different things. And um, it was just three months working up to it and then off of it and tried different things and went through, I would say, hell with me and my parents and my boyfriend just trying to figure it out. Um, Eventually, I decided I did not want to do any medications, so we started a different form of therapy, which is neurotherapy, where they Mm -hmm. put like the little electrodes on your head, Mm -hmm. and they send in brain waves to kind of repair the neurons that are like burnt out, basically, when traumatic events happen. Mm -hmm. So it's like PTSD therapy. So for about two years, twice a week, I would go to neurotherapy and talk therapy without medication. And I was so proud of myself because I was like, I don't want to do medicine. I'm fine. Blah, blah, blah. And then like something wasn't working and something still wasn't working. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I decided, okay, let's see what's really going on. And we realized it wasn't just like ADHD or depression, anxiety. It was bipolar one from my birth mom side of the family. Mm -hmm. And so um, I started medication for that. And while figuring out that there's medication for that, the same facility also offers ketamine treatment. Mm. So I'm just like, anything that will cure me, God, I'll try it. Like, honestly, at this point, because also like being able to have the parents I have, them being at like retirement and almost retirement age, they do have the money to support our therapy. And I would say the one thing that they didn't, (laughs) that they made sure of when they moved us to Utah and ruined our lives (laughs) was that we had therapy and help because Mm. they also saw that there was something off about Lone Peak, something off about Mm. like our switch and our behaviors and the way we Mm. acted and just everything. They were like traumatized themselves. So the one thing they always have done is pay for all forms and all types of therapy. Mm. And so, um, I mean, and, you know, sometimes people say, oh, it's like a Caucasian thing to like do all these things, try all these doctors, go to therapy, blah, 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 whatever. And I didn't even know it was like a stigmatism in the black community to like mm. not talk about mental health because mm. I've always been vocal with my parents because I never felt like they heard me mm. or that people looked like me around me, heard me kind of thing. And so um, I'm grateful to them for always paying for the therapy because I feel like things are finally starting to stable out. But not only that, I can like speak on so many different experiences with different therapists, with different types of therapy, with different medications and kind of educate people, um, obviously not medical advice or anything like that, Mm. but educate people on my experience as a black woman, because what I feel like people don't understand is different therapy works differently for different people and especially understanding black history and black backgrounds mm-hmm. and kind of especially when the stuff what was going on in 2020 or 2020 having to like having a therapist that understands that or at least is heavily researched in that is also very important mm-hmm. and medications and skincare medications and um mental health medications sometimes react differently in people with melanin in their skin or with a certain Mm. birth line um, or like sickle cell anemia is common in African people. And Mm. so those medications might not work the same. And Mm. so being surrounded by white parents, white doctors, white psychiatrists, white therapists, it was kind of hard to make sure I found people who I could trust to make sure they did the research Mm. because it Mm. would be that or going out of state or paying out of pocket or things like that. So it took a lot of work to get where I am today. And all I want to do is inform others because, you know, I feel like that's what will help people stay and want to be themselves out here and feel comfortable being out here, moving out here is being able to know the resources that can help them when they're really struggling, Mm -hmm. like the safe spaces for a person of color or a woman is of color too. So Mm -hmm. love that. Yeah. Yeah. So 
if you are comfortable with it, um, would you be willing to talk about like what happened in Colorado Springs and like what drove you to come back this way? Yeah. Oh my gosh. It like seems like a dream sometimes. Um, especially because it was like, it's almost like, I feel like pulling up on what a year or so. No, it's like four more months. It's been like a year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, um, about a year ago, I, I, this is when I was working at Top Golf as a manager. I'm about to finish college. And I was like, I'm just sick of Utah. Like, I feel like I still couldn't get a grasp, although I exceeded in college and in my job and in modeling, I still didn't feel like I felt like I was losing a sense of kind of the world. Cause I'm from Arizona. Like, it's fun. <laughs> like, mm. I was losing a sense of happy hour. I, I know pools. what you're talking about. <laughs> like, yeah. I really do know what you're talking about because yeah. I felt that way. And I've talked to Nate about this even. Like, I feel like my. I'm more negative in Utah. Just yeah, being, for no reason. being a black woman here just makes me be more pessimistic, more negative. Like mm-hmm. I was a happier person. I used to be more carefree. And yeah. I just feel like the experiences that you probably can like the experiences you've talked about kind of dim your light and like dim who you really are naturally um, just through the experiences that we encounter as black people, especially as black women in this mm-hmm. state. So I, I empathize with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like, I don't know, because I mean, feeling like, like you said, being in Chicago, we're out all night. Like, and we feel safe being out all night and where we go and where we're with, with our people and everything. Whereas Utah, I'm like, "Mm, everything's closed at 10. And I don't really have a group of people like that. I don't know the community like that. I can't ensure that there's a black community Mm here. Like, Mm -hmm. it's just like, eh. Whereas like other cities, I'm like, yeah, I'll stay out till two. I'll be Mm -hmm. able to find some people somewhere. I'll just, so yeah, it is really interesting. Like, like you said, you can relate. You're just like a little more like, eh, I don't even want to try anymore. Yeah. But it needs to be us that goes out. And it's just like, (laughs) oh, that's so annoying. Like we need to be the culture, but it's like, but we can't the, do it all. Beginning. I can't do it beginning. all. I can't be, I can't do it all. That's how I feel. Yeah. I'm tired of being a pioneer, but <laughs> no, literally. So, um, yeah, we, uh, me and my boyfriend, we just like took the risk and we moved out to Colorado Springs. Um, one of my best friends and actually one of my coaches at Utah state, he had moved to Colorado like quite a few years before. And we had kept in contact the whole time. And he had told me that his um, boyfriend at the time was planning on opening up a lounge slash bar restaurant and it would be their second restaurant um next to their first one they opened which was club q which was like the only gay bar in the colorado springs area Mm. so i was like okay let me go down there like i would love to live in colorado and so um we moved next to my best friend and i started working at the little lounge and something cool about that place is it's just like a small place so we would employee share and like honestly if i was gonna go out that's the club i would go to Mm -hmm. and like my best friend is obviously a part of the queer community. I'm a part of the queer community. Like, and so that's where we would go to hang out. How big of a deal was it to have a gay club in Colorado Springs? So I'm trying to think. So Colorado Springs is like right smack in the middle of like Pueblo and Denver. So North is an hour to Denver and then South is an hour to Pueblo. Mm -hmm. And I mean, as far as I was there for the year, I don't like I never went to like the next gay club or club area would be Denver Mm. or maybe I don't even know if there's clubs in like Castle Rock or those little areas, but there's mostly like stores, outlets, malls. So I don't really know of any other like gay club or drag scene area. Definitely not in Colorado Springs. That was like Mm. the the place for the community drag shows. They would have uh, shows where they would allow kids to come. They would Mm. do holiday events, um, every holiday dinners for people who um who were ostracized from their home who like didn't have a place to I stay who that. like weren't like yeah so they were so it was kind of like the only hub for the queer community within like a 50 mile radius yeah i would say okay. definitely within like a like yeah a good yeah i can't think of I, that's the only place i went so mm. yeah it's like i don't know so it'd be that and then um yeah i don't even know it's crazy we played bingo there there's drag show there there's brunch um I mean, it was just great. It was the perfect, like, little spot. I love that, like, my best friends were a big part of, like, creating and owning it and just, like, coming up with different ideas every year, being part of, like, Colorado Springs Pride and different things like that. Um, So, yeah, we were working there and just living our lives. And then um, end of November, um, I just got a call from my best friend. So he would have been um, one of the co-owners of Club Q, and he was, like, one of our friends just got shot. And I, I literally was like, what do you mean? Like, I was just like, I I don't even remember what I said. I think I was like something like, 
where even are you? Like, what do you even mean? Like, what are you even saying? Right. Right. Like, I don't even know what he was saying. And so he was like, I'm at like club Q and this person just got shot. And I was like, I don't even, I'm like looking at my clock. I'm like looking at the time, like looking around. And I was like, I do not understand like what is even going on right now. And so, um, he was like, we're at club Q. This is this. And I was like, okay. I don't, like I was in shock. And then I started going on Twitter, just looking up and there was like a live stream. Like somebody had come in and like wow. shot multiple people. Like it was literally like a shooting shooting. And then like, I was like, wait a minute. Like, okay, the shooter hasn't been apprehended. Do we like go there? Cause I lived like five minutes away from there. Mm. I was like, Clayton's there. Our friends are there. Other employees are there. Do I go there? Do I stay here? And I was just like, I don't know. We were just watching it unfold on live TV, on Twitter, on YouTube, on everything. And we were awake as it, it was like so crazy. We were awake, like as it happened, watching the world wake up to it, watching the news reporters fly into it, wow. like as it was happening. But like, we like, I don't even know, like me and my best friend were like, okay, we got to get ready for work. Like we just tried to go to work and like, he called me like, you better be coming to work. And I was like, I'm going to sleep. <laughs> like, I just went to, like, I literally was like, I'm going to sleep. Like, I didn't even know what to do. And um, he was like, I know I was like my makeup. <laughs> and he was like, okay, well, you need to come to work. And I was like, I'm not going to work. And I just like turned off my phone. Mm. He went to work because we were both like in shock and he tried to like work and everyone's like, what are you doing? And then he left work and came to my house. And that's when I woke up. And I woke up to him being there um, at my apartment and I was like, girl, what is going like, what is going on right now? And he just told me everything that happened. Um, basically, you know, someone had come into a club queue and he had just basically open fired in the whole bar um, and ended up killing, uh, you know, five different people and injuring a bunch of people. And um it was the people in the club that were able to apprehend him, take him down, mm. and get get him uh, secured for the FBI and the police. Mm. And, like, that was just it. I don't even know. It was just, like, after that, um, I guess I the whole world knew Club Q. And it was just, like, this little small gay bar. And, um, I mean, it was just, like, the—I don't even know. It's, like, crazy to think about. We just—we went to the church— we went to dinners. We went to different communities. We stayed together. We, um, I don't even know, like people from everywhere were trying to like help out. We were planning like vigils. We were planning uh, mm. memorials. Uh, I don't even know. We were like, we closed down, obviously the lounge. Club Q was closed. Um, there was just like, not, I don't even know. There was just like, I, the whole community was just like done. I like in my mind, it was just like mm. done for it. Cause I was like, wow, we really moved out here and we got involved in this. We got so quickly involved in the modeling industry and my boyfriend in his running industry. I was with my best friend having such a fun time. And then just like that, it was like, it felt like there was nothing left for us here anymore. Like that was basically it. We were here for like this little bit of time to like help bring some joy to the community and do what we could. And then it was over and it was time for and basically everyone in that space to try and move on and with mm. like um the press and the help and the donations people were able to rebuild and do new things in different places mm. or in the same place to kind of like start over again and um, me and my boyfriend and my best friend just decided to come back to utah because at the end of the day the only people that like consistently flew out to visit me in utah or in colorado and checked in for this and we're here for this were the people that I met in Utah. And it's like so crazy because like in my head, I never thought I would come back here. And then I wanted to come back so bad. And I, I knew that like when I came back this time, like it wasn't going to be the same and I wasn't going to live my life miserable or regretting things or upset and anybody I was going to make it different this time and I definitely feel like I've done that maybe a little bit more than I was ready for, oh, yeah, for sure. but um it's just been like so interesting to see the flip from like hating the state so much to finally feeling like I escaped to then being drawn back to the people here and the queer community here mm. and the black community here mm. and the ex-mormon community here like as I told you when we were out there I was like oh my god I get to go back 
to people who understand me. And like, I learned that in Colorado and I learned how to navigate it here in Utah. And so it was so interesting coming full circle to kind of saying like, I guess I like Utah now. And then going on to represent Utah and like take a national title representing the state is like, honestly, mm. like the biggest, like mind blowing right. thing to me. Cause I yeah. like almost would have died to be like being here. And now I'm like proud to be here representing the state and ready to be the one to make a change instead of let it try to change me. So mm. yeah, it's just a crazy ride. <laughs> yeah, that is. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. That was you had me almost tearing up over Girl, here so talking. <laughs> I'm serious. I just because like, no, I could feel <laughs> I could feel the power from what you were sharing. And so thank you. That was that was yeah. beautiful. Absolutely. And I don't think up to this point we've talked about like your your big claim to fame, right? You mentioned oh the- uh, <laughs> Yeah, we really hopped all over. I'm, I'm loving yeah. it though. You mentioned the national title um, that you that you took, and I believe you also took a state title right before the national title, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so yeah. talk a little bit about what those titles were, because they weren't in volleyball or yeah, gymnastics no. or- Not the side. <laughs> <No. laughs> yeah, tell us um, a little bit about like, what it was like coming back to the state that ruined your life, I know. Unquote, <laughs> and like kind of just like taking it over, basically. Tell us about what that is. Yeah, so- um, when, I guess when I was in Colorado, I found out about um, the Miss Bikini United States pageant from, I can't remember, I think it was my agent. She like sent it to me because they put a heavy emphasis on the modeling part and not just the talent part. And so they mm. took out like kind of the talent part of the pageant and made it into like a full modeling kind of portion being judged over the whole week. Mm. And so I was like, okay, I kind of model, I kind of do this. And one of my dreams modeling was um, to go to Miami swim week because one of the things I always struggled with was modeling was wondering if I would ever be able to be good enough, especially in Utah because I have tattoos. Um, but also if you guys have seen my Instagram account, I have really deep, really big scars on my legs from self-harm. And so one of the, one of my dreams was to always be able to model in my body with my scars and my tattoos mm. without um, editing them out or having kind of that issue like we don't want you because of this. And surprisingly, like by the grace of God or whoever, I have never had a problem with my scars leading up to this point. And so going to this pageant, going to Miami, being in Miami Swim Week, I felt like would be the perfect opportunity to finally be like, look what you can do no matter what you have been through. And it's like the most vulnerable you can be in a swimsuit. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I kind of want to do this and feel empowered. And I love wearing a swimsuit. It takes me back to my Arizona roots. And so um, I applied. And since Utah doesn't have a Miss Bikini prelim because it's Utah, <laughs> like a lot of the other states, um, I went through a series of interview processes um, with the regional pageant directors. And I got selected to represent Utah as uh, Miss Bikini Utah. And so um, until then, uh, this was around January at the beginning of this year, and the competition was, oh my gosh, it's August. So the beginning, I, it was, I literally left out there about a, exactly a month ago today. So wow. it's July 1st, and it was going to be a four-day competition in Miami. And it would be three days of modeling and uh, modeling swimwear and Miami Swim Week shows. And then the final day was going to be the pageant with our fantasy swim look, our evening gown, and um, interviews. I'm like, Artie, what, what did we even do? <laughs> and our introduction and everything like that. So... Um, up until that, I was preparing everything, uh, kind of just starting to embrace and kind of let the world kind of know more of who I am coming from Utah. Um, I'm the first black woman from Utah uh, to hold that title. So mm -hmm. there hasn't been another black Miss Utah. So yeah. my pageant director was really kind of uh, cheering me on and just mm. like, you're going to be something special. Um, and then a week before the pageant, I had like a manic attack and I called my pageant director and everyone else was like, I am dropping out <laughs> oh, wow. and I didn't want to do it. And I completely lost it. I was like, I don't want to go out there. I'm nervous about going out there because I'm away from my safe space and my family. And I'm nervous about this, this and that. And it was just like so much. And so that day I ended up calling my friends and my family and they just encouraged me to realize like everything that I wanted to do representing this title for my state, whether I won or not, like what I wanted to do being out there and meeting people. And so I was like, okay, I'll go. I'm going to do it. Sorry. I had like a crazy moment. Right. Um, and then while I was out there, it was super crazy because the whole time I was out there, I never felt anxious. I never felt stressed. Wow. I felt like 
I was finally starting to come into peace and like being kind of like proud to represent Utah. It was kind of weird. Like I was kind of like the unexpected person to be there from Utah. And everyone was kind of like, what the heck? Not this Utah girl. Like you don't look like, <laughs> I was like, Hey, I am from Arizona, <laughs> but I am a Utah girl now. And yes. so it was kind of interesting to give them a different perspective because they were looking for a cookie cutter um, mm. girl from Utah. And so to give a bunch of other girls that perspective and teach them about the black culture out here, because there was so many questions like from other girls around other states that were like, are you okay? <laughs> you know, how is it? Who do you talk to? Who do you surround yourself with? What are the people that are kind of doing things to help? And so being able to be out there and just like kind of talk to people and educate people about the stuff we're trying to do in Utah even was like so much fun. And I had so much confidence doing it or so much confidence doing it. Um, and then I guess like the night of the pageant, yeah, I took the stage and I finally felt like I guess for the first time in forever that like, it didn't even feel like a competition. Like I just felt like me, like mm -hmm. the whole time I had control over my looks, my personality, like not once that I feel like I had to fake it or hide it. Like you feel like you have to do in Utah. I don't want to cry. Um, cause it's like weird to think it's like, Oh my gosh, there's a bikini pageant. Like, it's not like that, mm -hmm. but like coming from the background I did and from everything I feel like that has like tried to, take over and just be in the way it was so nice to be from utah and be proud to be from utah mm -hmm. and feel confident saying i was from utah and know i was going to come back to utah do more things for my community um and just feel amazing doing it and then yeah i happened to take a title so i'm your miss bikini model united states Ooh, and <laughs> yes. yeah. and Incredible. i just want to keep doing stuff like podcasts and interviews and keep spreading awareness and tell people like nothing can hold you back no white people <laughs> can hold you back mm -hmm. no modesty standards dress code standards religion anybody um i overcame a lot of things and i want to teach others how to do it as well while also learning from other people how to keep overcoming things so that as i travel i can you know bring some utah to everywhere else but also have people come in here and feel comfortable adding to our community, you know? Mm, so, I love that. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's amazing. That oh, really like, is. Oh, wow. yeah. We've made like Stop. a full circle of like your whole journey, like love here. And then so like, yeah, we've gone through it all. And thank you again for just being so vulnerable and open and um, sharing know. about everything that has happened throughout your life. Um, and so to kind of, as we begin to wrap it up, what would you say is the biggest lesson that you've learned just through all of the experiences? I know that's really hard, so I'll let you do two if you want, but some of the biggest lessons that you feel like you've learned just through your different experiences and different um, challenges that you've, you've overcome. Okay. I would say one of the biggest ones is to probably not come at things with anger, but like a lot of peace and understanding and patience is so big for me. Um, and it takes a lot to like exist and a lot of patience to exist in this place. Mm -hmm. And also with the stigmatisms of like the angry black women or like the angry black male and being able to have that patience is so much stronger because we're able to sit here and educate people despite like all the arrows and the darts being thrown at us, which is like so much more powerful than like getting someone in the moment. Right. So I would say one of the biggest lessons I've learned is to try and be patient and understand and know who I am and not let like rumors or gossip or like things that have happened in my past stop me from being me or from sharing with others and like being around others who help inspire these things. Um, another lesson I would say is, uh, I don't know. I feel like there's like, I don't know. I feel like I gave a lot of mini lessons. In yeah, that. no, you're good. If that's <laughs> like, one. Like, let's keep with that. I just yeah, wanted to, I, was like, I just, just know you did it. With if yourself. you want to share more, you always are. All, yeah. All like I too. never thought seven years ago when I moved here that I would go through this many things and it was so annoying, like truly. And, but at the end of the day, like everything I went through literally has made me be able to understand so many different storylines, be able to talk about so many things that have given me so many different platforms and things to participate in. And ultimately, sometimes I like I struggle back and forth with like, I don't even know if I'm living for me yet, because like I live for other people mm -hmm. and what I can do for them. But I have to realize I can't do that unless I'm living for me first. And so seven years ago, I was not living for me. <laughs> and so now I'm sitting here like, wow, I would have never, ever known unless I had patience 
and waited for myself and trusted myself. So mm. yeah, that's another mm. lesson I would say. Beautiful. Love that. Okay. That is amazing. Um, I, think was, yeah. I think we'll leave it at that. Leave it at that? Anything else? <laughs> no, I don't have anything yeah. else. That was great. That's a perfect oh, place to leave thank it. Thank you guys. Okay. Um, we'll go to our recommendations now that we told you about. Uh, so we'll go first and you can marinate um, on what you want to recommend. Nate, you want to go first this week? <laughs> oh, man. Um, Where do you want me to go? Yeah, you can go. Okay. My recommendation for the week, you guys know I always recommend, like, I'm giving you a challenge to go do something. Um, so it's more of a challenge than a recommendation. But just with us talking about mental health today and um, things like that, it just, in, in dealing with my own mental health things recently and how helpful therapy has been, I just recommend everyone to see what's available to you. Um, I think there's a lot more resources out there than you think. And if you are struggling with anything and and whether it just be feeling sad, like there's, there's a, a label to things. And I think older generations make it feel like, oh, we're labeling everything and we, we always want to have issues and it's like, no, we're just actually being diagnosed. We're actually caring for what's going on in the world and the weight that we carry as people and how hard it is to exist as a person in the world. Um, not adding on any other challenging circumstances each individual has. Um, and so if you have health insurance, I highly recommend you calling your health insurance to seeing what your options are and seeing through your provider, like who you have who you can get, you know, a, a small copay for, um, through my health insurance, my copay of $30. And there's a lot of, um, options if you don't, like there's even health, um, if you don't have health um, insurance, you can, you know, get cheaper health insurance and still, um, like online, I think like Obamacare or something you can do through that, mm -hmm. like you can get health insurance and you can see a therapist through that, um, even on a small rate. And there is like free therapy options. Um, but I just recommend that because therapy has been so life changing for me as well as um, for so many other people. Um, and so I just recommend that because without it, I don't I don't know where I would be in the amount of clarity and understanding and help that I've gotten through being able to talk to a professional who studies the brain and has studied mood behavior. Um, it makes me feel like I'm not crazy and that I'm not um, experiencing like what I'm experiencing is like real to me and that I'm not alone and that there is a way to like work through whatever challenge I'm experiencing. So if you want to feel that way too, um, I recommend um, going to look at what your, your options are. And if you need help finding a therapist, um, Psychology Today is super easy if you do know your provider and like what you can go through. It's real easy. You can click through like your options of what type of therapist you want, um, your insurance, and um, you know, if you have specific issues that you want to work on, you can do that too. And it'll populate um, local therapists um, that will also, you know, if you want telehealth as well, you have a lot of options in there. So I recommend going onto that website if you need help actually finding that person. So that was a long one, but had to say it. Love it. For me, my recommendation this week, I'll keep it simple. Uh, me and my wife just recently went to the library and got library cards. And uh, we checked out a couple of books just to read, um, like at night in place of watching TV as much. Don't get me wrong, we're still watching TV, <laughs> but um, just a little bit less. Like we'll go to bed a little bit earlier and just read a little bit from the book. Um, and that's been fun. We're reading like some mystery novels. Um, you know, maybe we'll get some other things in the future. But um, that, that's, that's been fun uh, just because I feel like reading books is kind of like a lost art. Like people still mm -hmm. listen to audiobooks. Like I listen to a ton of audiobooks, listen to a ton of podcasts, but it's been a long time since I've just like sat down and read a book and finished it. Um, that wasn't a college textbook. Honestly, I think it's, it's probably college <laughs> that soured me on reading, to be honest. But um, relatable. Yeah. But growing up, I lived in the library. Like I was always there, whether it was my school library. Like I was the kid that was like, have the, has the new book drop? Like, do you guys have it yet? Like, You're I was that, that kid. Oh, wow. you know? um, so I used to love going to the library. And my family, we would have like a giant bin. Like, you know, those bins that you like keep your food storage or like your clothes in where it's like yes. two feet deep and like three feet wide. Right. We would have that. We would fill it full of books every week. And we would check out books and then we would like read them all, watch all the movies, and we take it back the next week, do the same thing again. Um, so, you know, it's it's important to to just read and like to, to give your mind something to do. Um, besides like look at a phone right like i have no problem with with enjoying a good instagram or tiktok video or whatever but sometimes just to like allowing yourself to imagine i think is huge um, mm -hmm. and books allow you to do that like there's it's just fun to be able to like read a book and kind of have these images swim through your head and they're like completely mm -hmm. created by your mind and like yes. what you know and what you understand um 
and so yeah that's that's a unique feeling unique experience so my recommendation get a library card go to the library get some books beautiful i love <sighs> what you got okay so i'm gonna do mini recommendations okay. off of both your guys' recommendations okay, okay let's do it. so with the books i love reading but like reading the books out loud because there's so many literacy skills you can mm. keep up on mm -hmm. by just reading a book yep. out loud. So true. And I always say, don't whisper read because it ruins your voice, like long term. Mm. So don't whisper read, but like reading out loud and like pausing for the grammar statements and stuff. It sounds like dumb, but like leaving college and stuff and getting out of like that writing and reading like mm. consistency, like you said, it like, I don't know, that's just one of the things I love, even though it sounds like a little crazy. But yeah, reading books like out loud and like really focusing on like learning new words and stuff. Um, and then for yours, for all the broke girlies out there, if you don't <laughs> have any insurance or Obamacare or Medicaid or any anything, options, right. one of the things that I found super, super helpful was TikTok and Instagram reels. I know it sounds crazy, but I will look up all the time adoption therapy. And sometimes there are literally licensed therapists that do lives. Like That's they'll true. do hour long yeah. lives That's and they'll true. talk about this lives about your inner child and like the separation, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And like, I have actually learned like so many different things. And like, obviously I'll go verify like their credentials or something, which are usually on their TikTok on like a link tree. Um, but that with like therapy or like specific, like there's always something or even on like um, Instagram, if you follow like therapists who will post like carousel yeah. posts yeah and it'll be like of different like today if you're struggling with this do these things i've learned so mm. many different things like hold ice or do this and it's just like from scrolling through therapy instagram you know that things like i've used for like four years mm. i like saw on instagram one day so yeah i always think about that like if i'm looking for a specific thing that's really bothering me and i can't see my therapist yet i will literally go look on tiktok and like wait for like a, a licensed so therapist yeah. to do a live literally yeah. so or even i recommend on instagram and she she does um tiktok as well she, i think her name is the holistic psychologist she's i think mm. she has two books so you can also read the books again if yeah. you can't um, go to formal therapy and it's not meant to replace it but it is meant to be a support and it to helps. give a resource and mm. um i highly recommend her TikToks have been so helpful because she, um, if you've ever seen them, she like acts out scenarios a lot of with like parent child relationships yeah, and she acts them her. out. And oh my gosh, every time I watch them, I'm like, wow, like that makes so much sense. Or like, I see people that I know that, you know, I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, this is you. Like, and, it and it's really, and so that. then it's like, she'll act it out and then explain kind of like what that impact has on you. So again, just giving you the tools to know like, oh, wow. I, my experience is valid and like there's there's words to it there's a way to also work on it as well so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah my gosh well yeah. yeah that's my little recommendation on recommendations <laughs> yes beautiful we're all on the same track same yes. mind track <laughs> and i'm gonna throw in one more recommendation i wanted to save in case you um wanted to recommend it. i'm gonna recommend i'm sorry going to see barbie beautiful movie <gasps> oh, yeah we could do a whole podcast episode about barbie what all of the explicit and implicit messaging was um great movie love it um i just think it's it was it was written very well and i and i love the light take on such a serious topic mm. um you know the topic of barbie and dolls um and like childhood is you know considered light but it it made it, it was the perfect way to bring about such an important issue um mm -hmm. and uh, ha really has a lot of complexity and depth when you think about it so that's why another one i'm throwing out there yes I love it. Cool. Love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's been a great episode. Yes, it has. Thank I'm you having so much fun. The best we've had so far. So yes. No, stop. <laughs> um, <laughs> but as always, um, if there are any stories that you want us to share or people you want us to interview, please email us at blackmenacespodcast at gmail.com and follow us on all of our social media platforms um, at Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. It's at the at black menaces and then on youtube we are the black menaces where we post the the videos of all of our um podcast episodes and if you would like to support us because we do this with our our, our own free time just you know sharing stories and um always doing what we can to be inclusive um you can donate at our venmo which is at the black menaces um or you can do a monthly or one-time donation through our website which is the black slash donate and then you can also um on there you can um, buy merch which is the black slash store and you can get any anything you would like but that's all that we have for this week and, and thank you thank and you guys that, <laughs> we'll catch y'all next week oh. <laughs>